Good. Why don't you give the choice? So, welcome everybody to this week's collective learning meeting. Please remember to mute your mics. Unless you want to ask a question, feel free to use the chat feature. I will be monitoring that. And if you type a question there, I can ask the question for you. And today's date is February 28th. And here today is Professor Jim Thompson. And take it away, Professor Thompson. All right. Well, thank you all for joining in this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to go over is uh, uh, something that seems like only yesterday, but is a 15-year-old presentation. Um, a 15-year-old model, a little bit better than that. And um, I think the purpose behind this is number one, to show the uh, durability of the model itself, um, but then also to invite people um, or at least one person to take on the model um, and update some data files, recalibrate it, um, and see whether or not it's still capable of making some useful predictions. Um, I tend to be kind of grand, or at least tended to be kind of grand in my titles. Um, and I, I call it the pursuit of immortality medical technology and the freedom of choice. So I, I touched a few bases there, but you'll see, I think as we go through it, um, that it does have some capabilities in exploring issues having to do with each of those. So the US healthcare system is in fact, the pursuit of immortality. Um, we're at a very early stage of it now, but ultimately the medical goal is to eliminate mortality and morbidity. And obviously that's a huge task. It will probably never be completed, um, but we have to know where we're going. And that's the direction of the US healthcare system. And I would suggest other healthcare systems. And if we look at some really key data, life expectancy at birth, um, life extension spending is the evidence of our pers pursuit of immortality. I'm just gonna pull a sheet of paper over. You won't be able to see it, but I'll be able to. Um, if we look at what causes this, um, we probably would, <clears throat> immediately think of the elaborate medical system that we have in place in the United States. And there's certainly an element of that that has contributed to it. But if we look at it really, potable water, sewage processing, and vaccinations have done more to extend life than any, than any single policy or number of shiny hospitals and great medical technologies. Surgical know-how, nutrition, and what I've deemed exquisite pharmaceuticals, that is pharmaceuticals that have been engineered to attack a specific problem, have added over 10% to our life expectancy in just two generations. So this little graph runs from about 1960 to about 2000. Um, it would be interesting, <clears throat> and one of the ch challenges um, that uh, um, come with this model to extend the data in here and see how we're doing currently. So I took a very simple statistic, national health expenditures as a percentage of our gross national product, um, and ran that juxtaposed with a line of like life expectancy at birth. And as we can see, they track very closely over the last 50 years. And as I, we could add another 20 years to this and see how we're doing, and that would be a measure of the efficacy of our spending. Back in, 
the early 2000s, I was very interested in trends in the health insurance market. And this runs from the year roughly 1999 to 2004. So about 15 years. And it shows that Medicaid <clears throat> had taken off very rapidly after the year 2000. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my voice here. I'll try to keep my comments limited. Medicaid took off with an expansion of Medicaid coverage. <clears throat> but interestingly, and Medicare just follows the um, 65 and over population trends. But interestingly, the number of people who were uninsured increased dramatically um, in the year 2003. And commercial insurance dropped a similar amount. Commercial meaning employer-based insurances had dropped at that point. I have no idea what the trend has been since then. And that's another, I think, very interesting statistic, especially in light of the conversation around the 2020 elections, at least the ones that the Democratic Party are creating. So, so Jim, for this graph, you pulled data from the reference sources, and so you use uh, several sources to build the data that you then plotted here? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. So did you find, I just had a question about that. Um, so obviously, I think some of those would, would have, uh, look at the data. Did you find differences between reporting information across those different data sets or data sources? I, I think that there are, on the one hand, on the other, these would reflect as we went back, and again, this is going back 15 years now, but when we went back, the totals added up. Okay, right. yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting because there are some, um, some of these inflection points and changes are so you were kind of starting to talk about there. They, you know, like you said, Medicare follows the population. That, that's an interesting kind of correlation. Does that make sense, right? The aging population. Um, but I've noticed that, that you know you have different types of policy, particularly since this has happened. The AAPCA, you know, the uh, Affordable uh, PPACA, has gone into to effect, uh, and then modifications to that have happened along the way. So. Um, those would, those would definitely influence these numbers, I'm assuming. Right. And, and again, I was looking at the changes year, to, year over year. And one of the other statistics that we could include would be the total number of people who are covered by each of these plans. The one that I focused on in particular um, back in 2004 was what was called uninsured. And that, of course, is of great significance today. We talk a lot about the number of people who are not covered by any kind of, of health policy. And it was the goal of Obamacare to reduce that number substantially, potentially even to zero. At the time, I have to move a little window that has your faces on it. Hold on. <laughs> At the time, <clears throat> I, I said, are they really uninsured or are they self-insured? And at the time, I suggested that they were self-insured, meaning they were willing to take the risk that their medical bills would be substantially less than any premium they could pay. So the question at the time was how to improve the value proposition, the value of healthcare insurance relative to the amount of premium that people were paying. 
I think that that's probably still a valid question today. Another big question, I don't know and if people have heard of Uwe Reinhardt, but he was a, a healthcare economist at Princeton. And I thought just a brilliant guy um, who wrote an article about 25 years ago called It's the Price is Stupid. <laughs> and his contention was the difference between US healthcare costs and all other systems is not the utilization or the access, but the prices that were being charged for utilization. In any event, it certainly is of key interest today to talk about pharmaceutical prices, but I would suggest all the price of all technologies is a very interesting topic for us to explore. And the model that underlies all of my research at the time um, clearly uh, looks at, at the healthcare, the cost of healthcare. So, sorry, I'm really losing my voice here at a very bad time. Um, I came up with what I call the healthcare cost index. And, and really no one has subscribed to this because the only people who ever saw it were at Cigna Healthcare. I shouldn't say no one because they did. But what I wanted to know was a lot of prices had increased in the economy, but people were getting especially sensitive to prices in healthcare. At the time, this is interesting, 15 years ago, about 170 million Americans were covered by what's called commercial medical cost insurance as a part of their compensation. So it was employment related. And what's really interesting to me about that number is that I've heard quoted over and over again by candidates for president in the 2020 cycle that about 170 million people are still the number covered by commercial medical insurance. And how is it that that hasn't changed over the last 15 years? I have to move some faces around again. I guess there's a way to minimize this. Oh, there we go. I do want to emphasize that in, in the model that I created, that healthcare, my healthcare cost index did not compare with the CPI because the healthcare cost index included consumption, what uh, another term would be severity. Let's see if I can get this to come up. So, so Jim, so when you say 170 million, you have to make sure I understand that. So, I'm if sorry, I, I, if it, I have family insurance and it's myself, my wife, and two children, yes, those four will be included in that coverage. Correct. Okay, so it's an, it's 170 million screen names. Um, you know, Covered lives. So, so what? So sounds about just a little bit over 50 percent of uh, the U.S. population. Uh, right. In Canada, in Canada, about 68 percent or 67 percent of uh, the population has private health insurance. Right. And I, I think people people always talk about the Canadian system in, in national health service because I've done work with them. And, um, you know, it's a misnomer when they think that everything's covered by the, you know, this national plan, so. We throw things up so rapidly, you know, Bernie and Sanders, not to pick on any one individual. Good one. Bernie Sanders has consistently talked about having universal health care with a single payer as being the standard in civilized countries other than, <laughs> other than the United States. And I, I spent a lot of time looking at the German and the UK systems, France, Italy, and they all have a very large private component to them. 
Um, it's not something that uh, they all have a blended system. <clears throat> the key is that un underlying that blended system is a governmental or single payer system. And, and I think that uh, the candidates who are talking about uh, Medicare for all who want it are probably closer to talking about the ideal of the European systems that do seem to work rather well. I'm not promoting any specific ideas today though, or maybe any other time. I'm kind of confused by all of this myself. So let's take a look at some of the key statistics. And these are raw data that I just accumulated over the years and that I would really love to see updated through about 2018 to see how they've gone. But here we have physician office, what I've called professional practice visits, but typically physician office visits um, year by year. This is the number of admitted bed days at hospitals. This would be the ER visits and this is outpatient or clinical clinic visits that do not require an overnight stay. And again, if we could track this against population trends, um, but the model that I developed was designed to simulate each one of these. <clears throat> the big question is, why do people go to the doctor? Why do people enter this system at all? And I asked this question 20 years ago at Cigna, and I got some very detailed answers. People talking about pregnancies and flu, and <laughs> immensely detailed answers. And I was looking for something a little, a little bit. Um, less detailed and came to the conclusion that people enter the system or go to the doctor to feel better. And why they would go to the doctor more tomorrow than today or today than yesterday, um, it could be, well, there are more diseases out there. I'm not sure that that's true. Um, there have been a few new conditions detected, including coronavirus as we were talking about earlier. Um, overall, the supply of, of medical conditions <clears throat> that can afflict any one individual has remained relatively constant over the last 50 or 75 years. Some get described with a little bit more care. Um, as I've said here, there are some newly described sets of system, symptoms like adult ADHD, which 25 or 30 years ago didn't exist as a, as a oh, hold on, I got a canvas call. Um, but overall, there haven't been a lot of new diseases. What happens is technology intervenes and we describe things with a little more precision and then come up with a way to treat it. Um, another characteristic of the system that has been overemphasized is that we're aging. And yes, we are, but the impact on, on healthcare utilization and costs is only about a quarter of a percentage point per year. So aging is a very slow impact on overall utilization. If I call the doctor and say, I've got the following symptoms, I'd like to come in and see you, the doctor's going to respond, I either, I have no idea what you're talking about, I've got nothing for you, or yeah, come on in, we've got a test for that. Um, or we've, we've actually got a remedy for your ailment. Um, so as technology has progressed, 
there have been more and more reasons for us to go to the doctor. In addition, we've got this little odd characteristic called moral hazard, which is I buy it and you pay for it. So people consistently will check to see, is this a covered, is this expense covered by my insurance? And when it's not covered, they have no interest in pursuing a, um, uh, in pursuing care for it or their, their interest can get blunted very quickly when they find out that it would be terribly expensive. And then they have to compare, is, is it worth it to me? So with all of that behind us, and I haven't really flashed up the model yet, maybe I should. I think if I hit Alt and Tab, I'll be able to see it. I think this is, yeah, this is the one I wanted. So it's a standard kind of Vensim looking model. Do, are people using Vensim or are they using Stella or some other software? I, I use both. I mean, but I, I kind of, lean, I personally kind of lean towards longer term to use Stella because of the interface building capabilities. Right, right. Yeah, the interface is prettier. Professor yeah. Thompson? Yes. We cannot see your Vensim model. We still see the slide. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, I thought you shared your screen. Sorry. Should have tested this before. Yeah. So, you might just share this app. I'd like so, to stop sharing and then both, um, share again by using. Okay. Yep. Oh, I'll see. You can see it now. You've made an no. update. This is my little COVID model. Let's see. When, when did you add the um, coronavirus? Uh... I did that yesterday. Do you see this one now? Yeah, yes. Okay. I'm not going to go over it, obviously, like any other model. It's got much more detail than we could possibly cover in an afternoon. But I guess what I wanted to show you is that it's sectorized. So as we go through here, we've got the um, professional office visit rate. Then we have managed care responses to that, the initiatives that they put into place to control the utilization. Here's a little sector on price. And I could go through all of these, but you, you're, you're getting the idea that the model detail rather than trying to put everything on one page, I, I just sectorized it very early on so that we could go back and find things like what's going on with inpatient visits and um, how are we doing with our calibration. Now I'm gonna to try to get back to my slides. So did you, um, did, did you have, looks like you have uh, emergency room visits, doctor office visits, I guess maybe outpatient visits, according to your um, map to doctor docs. What about like, uh, urgent, nowadays you see the, the proliferation of uh, minute clinics and urgent care facilities, and those, those stratify cost aspects of what they're pretty much doing to push certain types or classes of doctor visits out to uh, different care. Right, different, different, uh, a lower cost of care. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we could talk about that. Venue is very important in, um, in the model that, I, that I'm talking about here. I haven't included in this particular model um, the urgent care clinics that are retail-based. Um, I, I think that they're probably, at this point, relatively insignificant on the one hand. On the other, they may grow in importance over time, and that would be the type of policy that I would want to see tested with this model um, if we went forward to improve it. I certainly did while I was at, uh, at Cigna. Um, 
and what we uh, just a very very little anecdote uh, when I looked at it I said that minute minute clinic um, and not to pick on them as um, the only one but that sort of venue would be more likely to be consulted um, for things that would otherwise go unlooked at. That is, mom would be standing in line or dad standing in line and uh, uh, waiting to check out with their uh, Hershey bar and a prescription and uh, their, their child would be tugging at their, um, at their hand and they would take them to the clinic uh, for you know some little thing that would otherwise not be treated or addressed, it didn't seem that anything serious would be addressed at the at that at that level. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, but at the time, I felt it would. That, so that that's an interesting. You're touching upon something. Um, as you so you proliferate, or so you you make available in the system lower tiers of costs. Healthcare cost delivery or delivery systems, but then because they're more available, you may start to the consumption of those may be go up, and so you wind up exactly you wind up spending more money. Isn't that something uh, you know? I was out at uh, somebody, a uh, uh, Scott Atlas, Doctor Atlas, him and I were talking about the healthcare system. He's got a model of a market-based approach that he's been advocating. And he said, "Well, you start you start having people, you know, do more diagnostic testing, which is now I was just reading today the." Um, Gene sequences. Someone, uh, someone was. They were actually criticizing the article, but some folks. But the uh, down to hundred dollars, you can get your genome sequence now. You know, it's cost a billion dollars now. It's right. Like, and so, but the problem is that that doesn't. You can't directly make deci easy decisions on that for individuals' healthcare planning. Um, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tough one, um, and, and and really, it comes down to. I don't care, I don't care what you spend your money on. I really don't. What I care about is what you spend my money on. And when we get into the question of moral hazard, where people are spending huge amounts of other people's money to pursue things that are in particularly wasteful, um, that bothers me a lot. And that was roughly where I saw um, the market going. And I think it has remained that way. Um, but let me talk a little bit more about the model that, uh, that I constructed and, and, uh, and the one that I would like to see improved upon. Um, what we found um, in trying to make any kind of predictions about the healthcare system is that there's incredible detail complexity. Um, detail meaning, just as we've discussed, the, the number of different venues where you can seek care um, is expanding and will probably continue to expand because there's money there for people to make and potentially improve their health. There's also astonishing dy dynamic complexity and um, by this, I mean, there's usually very long time delays between some new reason to go to the doctor arising and the response of the system to it. Even though the system has approved it and said, yeah, you can go, you can go and it will be covered by your insurance. Um, after the decision is made, they realize, oh my God, everyone's running for this. And, um, and it takes years to develop an initiative um, that will help to control the cost. Lastly, there, <laughs> I call it messy and constantly changing interconnections in the system. And if we went through that model, we would find that the influence of any one loop changes, um, if not day by day, it seems to change very rapidly. So the loop dominance is difficult uh, to predict.
if you think about it, if somebody came up with a diagnosis today for a new, a new drug, um, it would take a billion dollars and almost 20 years to develop it. And I heard Anthony Fauci the other day talking about the length of time that it would take to develop a, uh, uh, I forgot <laughs> the words gone out of my head, vaccine um, for coronavirus. And he was saying about a year and a half would be under ideal conditions, the fastest that we could do it. That would break a huge number of records um, if we were to be able to develop a vaccination for coronavirus in 18 months. And it would definitely cost more than a billion dollars to do yeah. it. But the, uh, it was funny because in the news, because of the, uh, the, the swelling, the panic that's uh, you know, growing in, with coronavirus, there's, you know, the, some Israeli medical uh, innovation group has suggested they are close to a, a, um, a vaccination, a vaccine. But that's just, I don't, I don't know how, how good that vaccine would be, but then even to get that to the market, like you say, it takes a, you say it was available today, still even the ramping of the um, supply chain, manufacturing and the distribution takes quite a bit of time. Well, not, not to dwell on it, um, but it is, I think, a very interesting example. Um, the coronavirus, if it were, um, if the vaccine were traditionally based, it's based upon eggs. That is, the virus has to be deactivated and grown in an egg. And you would, <laughs> you would need seven billion eggs very quickly um, to, uh, to, and the manufacturing capability to, to manage it. Um, and we can make about 300 million doses of traditional flu vaccine, vaccine now. And that, that's for the whole world. About a quarter to a half of it is used in the United States and the rest of it gets sent through, uh, throughout the world. Um, but imagine if we, if we develop a vaccine for uh, coronavirus, how rapidly countries would be demanding that they, that they also have access to it. And uh, the, the manufacturing capabilities simply aren't there. So even though we may have a vaccine that works medically, um, the chances of it uh, entering the supply chain effectively to stamp out the, uh, the proliferation of the virus um, in any reasonable period of time are pretty much zero. So do you, see, do you guys see my uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yes. How's a loop map? Okay. This was just, I, there's no way that I would go through a causal loop map with you today, but this is just to show you at a very high level um, how complex the system is in the model that we're dealing with. And I, I did want to emphasize that there's one um, key feedback loop in the model, which helps answer the question, why do people go to the doctor more tomorrow than they do today? And that is the technology loop, which I'll take you around real quickly. Um, but we have in the technology loop, a physician diagnosing someone, sending that person to the, with a prescription to a pharmacy. Um, the prescription gets written, there's a profit margin um, involved, there's a little R&D money left over um, after the executives get paid. And uh, then the research lab looks at unmet medical needs and develops, a, hopefully, a, over some period of time, a new molecular entity um, which enters into the medical technology solutions and the doctor finally has something new to prescribe. So this, is, this to me, is the most powerful feedback loop in the healthcare system model. Um, because it really helps to explain um, why people go more often. 
Uh, what I would like to point out is that the emphasis has consistently been over at least the last 50 years developing treatment um, rather than cure. And because of a cure, you get a one-time payment, um, but treatment you can go on forever, um, or at least for the lifetime of the patient. And so the pharmaceutical industry is just driven to develop things that treat diseases without necessarily curing them. Um, and there are some great examples um, that uh, defy that description. Um, one being the treatment for hepatitis C um, that was uh, that came on stream about five years ago. Um, but the cost of that drug to the patient, well, to the system, was on the basis that if we hadn't developed it, this cure, the patient would have spent about $80,000 in the treatment of hepatitis C before death. And therefore, we're charging $80,000 per patient um, to cure it. <laughs> so there was no net savings to the system. Kind of unbelievable, but that's the way it is. Yeah, I, um, that, that's been sort of uh, a lot of, there's a number of companies um, in Cambridge. I, I go to meetings because I'm in the healthcare industry. Um, and they had a series with the Mass Biotechnology Council where they were talking about um, curative technologies, gene therapies now, and how to price them. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's because of exactly what you're talking about. You know, if someone's a cure for blindness, you know, uh, how much is that worth to somebody? Right? This one gene, if we were bio that's coming out, um, and it's going to be able to cure uh, congenital blindness. Uh, and so, or it has hope, it has potential, I guess there, it's hopeful. So they, they, they were talking about some, I thought some crazy stuff um, when they were describing how they were gonna pay for it. But then a doctor friend of mine said, no, that sounds okay. And I was like, well, maybe I don't understand enough. Um, right, I just personally had a procedure in uh, the middle of December that improved my lung function dramatically. And uh, there are little valves that are put in your lungs that improve the, the efficiency. I won't go into all of the <laughs> details of it, but um, I'm very grateful for the technology advancement. And I frankly never asked how much <laughs> is this gonna cost? So yeah, don't take me as being a complete cynic about it, but I do sometimes wonder at uh, the ambitions of uh, some of the players in the industry. Anyway, getting back to the model. Um, I suggest that we gain confidence from understanding how problems arise. That is, when we see how a problem occurs within a very large system, like the healthcare system, um, and we are um, tied to the data um, very well. Once we understand how the problem arises, uh, we gain confidence in our solutions. Uh, when we say we're going to appoint a committee uh, to take a look at something, our confidence is relatively low. Uh, but as that committee gains or improves their understanding, um, we can have some confidence in their solutions. In my case, I'm very model oriented, um, but at the end of the day, I realized that models don't make forecasts. People make the models that, that help them make their forecasts. And um, the model is nothing more than a voice in the conversation. And I, I think I stole that line from uh, John Sturman's Business Dynamics, but uh, it remains true. So no matter how uh, proficient we are um, or how exquisite our models might be, at the end of the day, we have to have confidence in what we've learned. And not to say the model says this, but I say this for the following reasons. And I think that's really important um, for anyone who is developing a model to understand. So how did the 
big healthcare model do 15 years ago? And here I've got the little red dots showing what the model simulated relative to what the data was at the time. And I would dearly love to see that extended, not ignored, but extended another 15 years to see whether or not we have a model that we can really rely on over the long run. And that's one of the reasons, that is the principal reason why I would like to have someone take it over at, uh, at Worcester, because I, I don't have 15 years of uh, calibration left in me. <laughs> Some of the questions that we have, and uh, a couple of them have been raised already today, is uh, we can understand better the trends in consumption and uh, prices and venues. Um, but the healthcare system model that I'm proposing you guys take over predicts how consumption, prices, and venues are influenced by technologies, care management, and the availability of those things. But the predictive model simulates very complex dynamics that make it very difficult to understand what causes what. Um, that is, it's a very noisy environment. So in order to, it, to um, make analysis easier for anyone using the model, I, I have put the model into two states um, and you just flip a switch in the model. One is a steady state where it is um, initial conditions for each of the stocks is determined algebraically and the parameter values simply reflect how things were on one day, any day uh, that we started. And uh, then we just knock the model with a, a, some new loop or if we want to, a new disease. And that disturbs the equilibrium and we can see um, what the effect is on the system and make some predictions of what's going on, what's causing the change and, um, and how significant the impact will be. And of course, all of the changes can then be traced back to that single perturbation. So the equilibrium state of the model, is the dynamic equilibrium state of the model is very important, I think, to analysis. So I have a path to update, which is to get an overview of the model um, in much more detail than we could do today and then track back to the data sources. By the way, I only use publicly available data, even though I cited in, um, uh, in my presentation that Cigna, uh, uh, I think it was called Cigna Healthcare Insights. Um, that was the department that I ran while I was at Cigna. And um, so we were responsible for the creation of this model. Um, I own now the copyright to this model, and that's what I would be passing on to Worcester. Um, uh, in its many forms, there are actually 50 different versions of the model um, used for to answer various questions, including things like Minute Clinic. Um, at the time, SARS was very popular, so there's a SARS segment that can be reparameterized for the current COVID-19. Um, if you wanted to do that. Um, but we can go back to these publicly available data sources to recalibrate the model, gain some confidence in how it's doing and its predictive value, run the calibration routines, and then analyze changes in the parameter values to answer future research questions. So that's where we are. <clears throat> So it's interesting that you mentioned like um, to talk to questions that you can you can um, pose and then evaluate in the small because um, I was interested. I had talked to to uh, Professor Ajiki and Mike about um, it was an interest in um, just an interest in simulating a, a kind of a Medicare for all against a market based 
model, uh, the market-based model that I just mentioned. It's uh, driven off of a book written by um, Dr. Scott Atlas. He's you know talked to the yes. The, are you, do, you, do you know who he is? Pardon? You know do you know Scott Atlas, Dr. Atlas? Um, no, I know the work. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I read it. I didn't agree with all the stuff in it. I, I, I told him that in his book, and he, he said, well, you need to look more into more of my stuff. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, the Dartmouth Atlas is a very powerful research tool. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so we, so we, um, so we thought that we might you know, want to kind of actually do a, do a model. So this would be actually, this would be a huge lift. This would be the type of model that would be a huge lift. I mean, a giant to, to be able to, without building from scratch, uh, you know, the healthcare system. Sorry, the... Professor Thompson? Froze. Yeah, I think so too. Oh. He may be still talking, thinking we're hearing. Yeah, I'll call him. I actually have a question about how this is different from Rethink Health. Oh, I think he's back. Hello. Uh, Professor Thompson, you're muted. For some reason, it just died on it. Now, am I unmuted now? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. So, does anyone else have any questions? We are we still have. Yeah. Eight. I have a quick question. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Thompson, for your presentation. Uh, my question is. Um, in your research, did you compare different healthcare systems? Uh, if so, uh, did you find there are some leverage points in terms of efficiency? And if you have, uh, you know, from that research, some comments and uh, experience that you would like to share with us? The, the comparison of systems um, required, from, from my perspective, a very different and much less detailed model. Um, but I would be delighted if someone were interested um, to show what I did in uh, comparing the English, the German, by English, I mean UK, uh, sorry, UK, uh, the German, and the US systems. I think I did enough work on France um, also that it would, uh, France, Italy, and Spain were also included. Um, some of the work may, some of the work um, involved pharmaceuticals where the information could be proprietary, but we could lift out the non-proprietary information from that. So no, I, by the way, I never found, the, the only leverage point that I found that, that worked fabulously was the price of prescription drugs. Um, and uh, if prescription drugs were not, so we've seen an explosion in the use of prescription drugs, a lot of which gets attributed to the uh, direct-to-consumer advertising trend in the United States. Um, I, I would say it had much more to do with um, Medicare Part D, um, but that's that still needs to be researched. Um, but when a drug is not covered by an insurance plan, um, it's re really almost fatal for that drug to exist. There's, uh, there's some interesting though comparisons of, of the cost system, cost structures for uh, for pharmaceutical drugs in you know in the U.S. the way that the reimbursement works in the U.S. versus in like uh, in the EU. Yes. They do, ref, you know, they do reference pricing models, and we're you know I know I know when pharmaceutical companies are trying to get into those markets, they'll 
you know, apply in, even though it's EU takes, you know, this is kind of one sort of know, amalgamated country, so to speak, or as an entity, it's a union. Okay. Um, the, um, they'll actually, they'll actually make decisions about going into one market to try to maximize the basket of goods, you know, so that they get better pricing. Um, and just as we had looked at, or I talked with, I talked with a team that I work with about possibly looking at using a finance model to kind of think about some opportunities to optimize their decision making about how to go to market and things like that. You know? um, but I also feel that because of that, we, we wind up U.S. innovates and then they discount geographically, and so we wind up subsidizing um, prices of pharmaceuticals in other countries. So. That's been our gift to the world since World War II. Yeah. Um, it, it really, and it really has been. Um, I talked with Jay uh, Forrester for a long time um, about what can be done in the U.S. healthcare system. And his first conclusion was that uh, the U.S. healthcare system is designed to increase cost. Um, and clearly, as I say, that's what my model found, but I, I went in with a little investigator bias um, because Jay definitely influenced that thought. Um, and then his other thought was our gift was the pharmaceutical and our pharmaceutical industry is a gift to the rest of the world because we end up absorbing really most of the R&D and creating most of the profit around drugs and uh, the rest of the world benefits from that. And I think a lot of people are getting upset by that thought now. Um, there's been a massive redistribution of wealth throughout the world. And so there's a question coming up, very, very important social question. Do we continue that legacy of um, basically giving away the medical technologies that we create? I mean, if you listen to the politicians, they, they say that the U.S. should lead in lots of ways continually, but then they say that prices for pharmaceutical drugs are cheaper in other places and we're being unfairly, um, you know, paying exorbitant prices. The U.S. I'm like, oh, well, if we actually paid fair market value across all the geographies, the picture would look a lot differently. And I, just don't think, I don't know whether this is the politicians are just, um, I don't know if they don't understand the system, because they're, they're being kind of disingenuous in the way they describe the system. Right, you know, and I think it's I think it's to be a political advantage to do it that way because the you know most of the voting block doesn't understand that this these things are happening. Uh, I worked in a medical device company prior to where I work now, and um, we would always get requests in different general. First of all, some countries would, for China as a good example, would they work to keep us out of the market because they had competitor companies in the market, so they make it very hard for us to register the products. So we innovate, and then we have this long delay to get registered to sell into our rental market. And then there would be a lot of the way the tenders and things like that work. Uh, you know, we'd have salespeople asking for discounts below the cost of goods, you know, manufactured. And we like, right. that doesn't make sense, right? You know, especially, well, we'll get a foothold in the market, you know. We make up for our losses with volume, which I never understand. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and I worked for another guy at an aircraft company that, that was his view. We'll sell it, we'll sell it for less than we can manufacture it for, but that'll be good for us. <laughs> well, I worked in the Indonesian healthcare system for two years um, on capacity analysis. And their, their, their drug policy was it had to be manufactured in Indonesia or to be sold in Indonesia, or else it needed a special dispensation from a committee. So there were a huge number of drugs that were not available um, in Indonesia. It didn't make a lot, a lot of difference because the poverty level in Indonesia is breathtaking. That is, people really couldn't afford a lot of what they needed anyway. But um, it was an interesting approach. Um, the other hand, in the United States, we tend to favor generic drugs hugely in our commercial and governmental insurance plans. And yet generic drugs imply something that is usually 17 years old or older. And so anything new 
that comes out takes a long time to get to that generic drug um, schedule. Having said that, that seems to be the basis of what um, several of the Democratic candidates are proposing, is that we have a generics only option uh, for people. And uh, I, I'm not sure that that's the most humanistic approach that we can find. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that, that's why I think it's another naivete in their thinking because, um, you know, I've looked at, I looked at the Trump, even the Trump America plan, which, you know, um, is, is a push for a greater, you know, number of generic, um, you know, or genetic, generics or biosimilars. And I'm like going, well, eventually you're going to run out of those, right? Because you're going to need some. Really? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have the uh, initial innovation, you won't have something to make a generic of, you know? So it's, there's only so much, and some of the manufacturing, I mean, they'll continue to innovate in manufacturing and drive down costs. I mean, they've done a really good job of that. I mean, this, that's, that's what they've made. Actually, it's funny. I saw an interesting, for innovation in healthcare versus new molecular entities in the market, we've done, the drug companies have done a great job at the front end of the pipeline, but they keep failing where they get the you know, the longest market because they make machines that can, you know, do a lot of the, automate a lot of the human steps. And so they can create a lot more targets and try out new drugs, but they're not necessarily going to be, you know, they get the effect this, but they're still, this, but then they, once they enter the trials, they still spend both loads of money. Right. So the big dollars get spent, so. Well, all that that says to me is that there's huge space to improve. There's lots of room to yeah. improve the system. And we don't have to fix everything all at once to make things better for everyone tomorrow. Okay. So we are actually two minutes past the top of the hour. And I just want to thank Professor Thompson for your presentation. And if anybody needs to sign out, please feel free to sign up. Okay. And I don't know if you're available to stay on the line to talk more, Professor. Um, I can stay around for a few minutes, but I'm kind of running out of voice again, so. Okay, because I also need to prepare for another meeting, which is. So just, yeah, just, um, so, so just look at your model. Your model has a really interesting, I mean, I recognize a lot of the, a lot of the components I'm quite familiar with. I mean, the stuff you have in there, I haven't seen the model in detail, but I recognize a lot of what you put in there. So there's a tremendous amount of work. What's really about that, what appears to be really great about that model is you can, you can start doing research, or answering research questions against it. Um, like comparative systems, uh, a new uh, thing, a pan, potential pandemic comes into the, into the you know, uh, ecosystem, so to speak, or the health system. Um, Different types of innovation, approaches to innovation. You know, we, we've been talking about uh, concepts of real options in the healthcare. You're looking at, uh, you know, uh, some some countries have advancing models on public-private partnerships to be uh, innovation enablers, but then that has, but then they actually get something out of that investment. But does that actually, in total, change the net healthcare net cost? You know. Um, because people believe they will, but a model like what you have may say no, you know, or it doesn't give you enough, doesn't really give you the total return that you, you believe. So let's see, wait for, for the rest of the, for the topics. Christine, we have a bunch of questions. No, we were just randomly chatting in the uh, group chat. Okay. So is Jim, Jim still on? I think he might be frozen again. Uh, all right, well, we, we can catch up with him later. Oh, so Tom, I'm not sure who Tom is exactly, just his first name, has a methodological question. Oh, hello. I just got back no, Professor Thompson's lagging, but I can save this question and email both of you unless he can get back to answer. I think it's a message. Mm. 
Well, he's got a he's got a process, obviously, right? Because he wants to do it again. So that's a modern like that I do. But I think I'm gonna go. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Thanks. Pull out of this. Oh, I think he signed out. Yeah, I guess I. I have we'll, ask, we'll, we'll find Jim. Oh, he's back. Jim, are you still here? Waiting, waiting. Christine, everyone, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.